Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsis with Anand Theravengadam. He's going to talk today about analog fault simulation. Anand, where are you seeing the problems in analog fault simulation these days? Where, What markets, what sort of problems are cropping up? Let me just take a step back and kind of talk about what's driving the need for analog fault simulation. Um, you know, we all know automotive is experiencing significant growth. And in particular, uh, the safety critical applications are driving a lot of growth in the semiconductor market. Um, I'll give you a few examples. ADAS, vehicle connectivity, infotainment, and electrification, electric cars. Now, if you look at these safety critical applications, uh, the fundamental enabler for these applications are the automotive electronics. So the IC vendors, the SOC vendors, and the IP vendors have to essentially adhere to a much more stringent set of safety and reliability requirements because they're, they're essentially catering to these applications. And that is where analog fault simulation comes in because now they're looking for systematic ways to ensure that the designs are reliable and they're tolerant to faults and failures. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. Anand, what have you drawn out for us? Sure. I, I just wanted to give you a sense for the, the what's driving the need for analog fault simulation. So what I'm, here is essentially three applications for analog fault. I'm going to use that as a way to kind of articulate what the need is and what's driving the need. So the first bubble here you see is functional safety verification. And that ties in very closely to the, the idea of you know, ensuring safety on automotive ICs and SOCs. So that's this one, and I've written ISO 26262, as you may notice, and that's essentially one of the key um, you know, guidelines, if you will, that automotive vendors need to adhere to or follow. The second bubble is the test coverage analysis bubble. That's for manufacturing. This has always been around. It's just that now more and more IC vendors are using analog fault simulation as a way to improve test coverage. That's the second application. The third one is silicon failure analysis. That's, again, yet another way in which you can use analog fault simulation to improve uh, or speed up the whole failure analysis process when you get field returns. So when you're dealing with an analog fault, it may not be obvious as the chip comes out the door that there's actually a fault there, right? Because it's, it's both contextual depending upon where it is in a system. Uh, it's also potentially use case dependent because it varies from one use to another. Your driving habits may be different than mine. That's correct. That's correct. And that is, I think, the reason why... Um, you know, the ICs in the electronics needs to be able to comprehend all of these different scenarios and situations. That goes back to the simulation, how you do the simulation, how you set up the simulation. Um, it goes back to identifying what the failure mechanisms are, what the failure modes are, identifying what safety mechanisms you have to be able to mitigate those failure modes. And then using that information to set up the right set of simulations and finally come out with the analysis to say your design is tolerant to falls and so forth. So let's drill down into this. What's different here on an analog uh, circuit and fault versus, say, a digital circuit? That's a great question, actually. Um, I'll turn your attention to these two flow diagrams here. Now here, the first one is essentially the functional safety verification flow that typically is adopted by companies. It starts with the design and identifying what the safety goals and requirements are for the design. And then you get into this detailed FMED analysis, failure modes, uh, effects and diagnostic analysis. And that's where fault simulation comes in. Now there is another flow here that I've drawn which is for test coverage analysis, which is your traditional idea of grading test vectors using fault simulations or as I call it here as fault campaigns. Now to your question, fault campaigns here can be performed using digital fault simulation or analog fault simulation. Now the digital fault simulation here is what has been traditionally done by companies. Now more and more companies are switching to using analog fault simulation in addition to digital fault simulation. And the key difference there is that digital fault simulation is at the RTL or gate level. Analog fault simulation is at the transistor level. Now soon you'll start to see the benefits of analog fault simulation. Historically, IC vendors, SOC vendors have always suffered from poor coverage on the analog circuits. On the digital, they have very good coverage. And that's where analog fault simulation comes in because it can help you cover a larger percentage of the SOC, but more importantly, the analog portions of the SOC. How much of the semiconductor content in an automotive uh, application is going to be analog versus digital? It depends on the application. It depends on the end market. It depends on the, uh, on the segment it's catering to. But 
you know, for an automotive SOC, you could have anywhere from 20%, 30%, or 40% even, depending on the type or the application. People really better get familiar with how to test and how to develop analog chips. This has typically been two separate worlds that the, the, they haven't really talked in the past. That's correct. That's correct. And in fact, there's still, I think, uh, two different teams, two different you know, uh, philosophies or approaches to, uh, to doing chip design, if you will. But then I think the point is, I mean, there's always cross-pollination, so the analog team is borrowing from the digital in terms of concepts uh, for simulation and verification, and so is the, uh, the other side. And I think here uh, it is the case where the digital leads uh, in terms of methodologies, and now it's kind of slowly you know, you know, going over to the analog side in terms of methodologies. And analog engineers have typically not embraced a lot of the EDA tools in the past. Is that being forced to change now because of what's going on here with the liability? Um, I would say, I would characterize it as an increased need um, for certain types of verification and, and simulation. Um, so traditionally, uh, analog designers or circuit designers have used you know, layout for capture, I mean, uh, environment for capture, uh, and then s traditional transient simulators, uh, some a mix of AC analysis and, and uh, DC analysis and so forth, but primarily it's been just, you know, the regular uh, custom design chain or custom design tool verification, if you will. And now I think they have to think about verifying a design for safety, which is new, verifying design from a test coverage point of view, and then also uh, get familiarized with things like automotive concepts, ISO concepts, and so forth. So it's, it's definitely a new set of challenges. So when you're dealing with analog fault simulation, what are you actually trying to find? What, what, what are you trying to simulate there that you were not trying to simulate in the past? Yes, that's a great question. Um, analog fault simulation fundamentally is to do with catastrophic faults. You know, the most important thing is catastrophic faults, which is essentially saying that, you know, if you have manufacturing defects, that manifest themselves as faults, and that's essentially what we are trying to simulate. So the fault models are, you know, your shorts and opens for transistors, shorts and opens for resistors and capacitors, and diodes, and so forth. So the traditional idea of, uh, you know, the digital faults you had stuck at one and stuck at zero, you have that here also, but you have a larger set of fault models to contend with, and that's primarily uh, manufacturing defects. And then, of course, comes in transient faults, which is where imagine you're driving a uh, you know uh, in a, uh, driving in your car and you get bombarded by radiation that can cause something in your electronics to flip for example that's a transient fault we have scope for that as well and then finally the most important thing is analog fault simulation also deals with parametric fault analysis which is where you're talking about large variations in the parameters of devices beyond the traditional bounds that you typically simulate with Monte Carlo and that can cause failures. So that also is comprehended. So, so you can soon can kind of get, you get the picture that the fault models we are dealing with in analog fault simulation is a large set, much larger than the digital fault models. And also as you start dealing with automotive and we move into uh, level four, level five type of driving, there's failover going on in these systems and the systems that they fail over are not necessarily ones that you had to do this kind of fault analysis for in the past, right? Everything is now connected and everything is part of the safety critical infrastructure. That's correct, that is correct. And that's where I think the increased scrutiny comes in. So it, the onus is on the IP vendor and the IC vendor as you go through the value chain to ensure that if they're developing IP, it's developed either as a safety element or of context with assumptions or it's developed in context, and there is there are a set of guidelines that the ISO 26262 document uh, outlays, if you will, right? That, that helps the designers and the suppliers, if you will, kind of develop their IP and supply their IP and ICs uh, that can meet the requirements of ACLD or ACLC. So what are the main challenges that the engineers are working with here, and how do they solve them? Thanks for that. Um, as you can see, uh, the analog fault models are pretty large in number. Right. In fact, we have 10 fault models for a transistor. So for any design, let's say a thousand transistor design, you're talking about 10,000 faults. So that, you know, soon you get the, uh, it starts to become a large problem. So let me turn your attention to uh, some of the key challenges here for analog fault simulation. Fundamentally, analog fault simulation is a transient simulation. So the typical challenges associated with transient simulation apply here as well, which is performance and capacity, in particular, as you go up the abstraction chain for subsystem and full chip analysis, it becomes a big problem. Performance and capacity are a uh, key care abouts. Pre-layout versus post-layout, that comes in as well. And also mixed signal, 
And mixed signal fault simulation is very important because ultimately vendors, SOC vendors and IC vendors are looking to do fault simulation at the mixed subsystem level, which involves a bunch of analog components and digital safety mechanisms. So that's one set of challenges. The other one is of course throughput, because like I said earlier, you have to deal with thousands and thousands of faults in a large design. And so how do you get the throughput? How do you finish your fault campaigns within say three days or a week? And then finally, always ease of use. Set up, launch and debug, um, you know, familiarizing yourselves with ISO concepts and you know, having some sort of a guide from the tool, if you will, to help you navigate your way through the challenges of analog fault simulation. As you're developing these analog chips, do you get warnings that say this is not compliant with the ISO 26262 uh, regulations or standards or best practices for doing something? Yes, actually, in fact, it's top down in the sense when you design your IP, you essentially have a certain target. And that target is essentially prescribed by ISO guidelines. For example, if you have an ACLD, which is the highest level uh, in terms of automotive safety, um, ACLD application, then you have a certain uh, set of metrics and certain target values. For example, the single point fault metric, which is one of the most common metrics for fault simulation, for safety, if you will, uh, it needs to be greater than 99% for ACLD application. So you have a set of target values that you need to go after. So when you do fault simulation for a given application, you need to make sure that you're able to either meet or exceed these requirements. So how do you go about solving these, these challenges that we've been talking about? Sure, so any commercial fault simulation solution needs to essentially comprehend these challenges, especially being able to enable the, the end user to simulate the subsystem and full chip level. And that's where I think, uh, you know, I believe that having a FastPass technology will help greatly because FastPass technology gives you the performance and the capacity, especially for subsystem and, and full chip type analysis. And then also integration with class leading or, or solid digital simulators and that essentially enables the mixed signal aspect of it. When it comes to throughput, there are many techniques uh, by which you can reduce the number of fault simulations you need to do. There is the basic fault reduction. There is also fault sampling, where given a universe of faults, you can select a subset of those faults and use that for simulation for a certain target coverage. But how do you do that is where the secret sauce is, and, and, and that I think is an important requirement. And then of course, finally, parallel simulations will also help you because it's just running simulations in parallel for better throughput. And on the ease of use side, again, flexibility to use a batch mode or a GUI, if you will. Um, ease of configuration. When I say configuration, I'm talking about fault models and, and so forth. Um, and then automatic and manual flows where you, know, you can do a seamless one step, if you will, type of fault simulation, you do everything fault identification, reduction, simulation, and output reporting, or you can do a manual where you can insert manually certain faults and, and that the flexibility is very important. And then guide for things like sampling. When I talk about fault sampling, it's a very uh, an important topic because the idea here is to sub select a subset of faults from the large universe. And how do you select that? You actually have to uh, select that based on the probability of failure or likelihood of failure. And that's where weights come in. You, the user needs to be able to provide weights, and based on the weights, the tool will essentially select the, uh, the sample size, if you will, and run the simulations. So how do you use sampling? And is there a way that you can guide the user, a priori, even before running a simulation, to say, you know, if you use, select a certain sample size, say a sample of 100, and if the estimated coverage is, say, 40%, what is the confidence level, if you will, for the result? Or what's the error tolerance for the result? If you give that information a priori, that'll help the user select the appropriate sample size based on their requirements and based on the comfort level. So these are all some things that typically are required in a, in a commercial solution to be able to make this practical and meaningful. Would you do this for every analog chip or would you only do this in a safety critical market? There's a lot of steps here. Yes, it primarily when it comes to functional safety, it'll be for the safety critical market. And in, in fact, even if you drill down further, even if you say it's a, an SOC for an automotive application, the safety critical application, you know, there are blocks in there that are not related to safety. And you can safely exclude those and only focus on the blocks that are directly related to safety. And that type of analysis always happens before you start the actual simulation. Anand Thurvangatam, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you for the opportunity, Ed.